Okay, this, this is the Nikon ZF. Okay, so this is the Nikon ZF. I'm in aperture priority with the 24 to 70 f2.8. There's a lot to love about this camera immediately, and there's a lot I have yet to learn and some sort of major issues, especially with handling, and I probably didn't get the right lens, but image so far is great. Okay, my addiction to compact full-frame cameras has reached peak concern. As a typical Sony shooter though, the move to Nikon has been an unexpected turn into my descent into madness. But the question is, will I keep the Nikon ZF and how does it compare to my experiences with the Sony a7C II, a true hybrid, or even the Sony ZV-E1, a pure video camera in both departments and I could sell both Sonys and just switch to Nikon or should I just get the Fuji X106? Well, kidding, well, sort of. So I'm gonna show you some POV of portrait work that I did and some video comparisons in N-Log with the ZV-E1 in S-Log3 while peppering in tons of pics I took with various settings in various locations, which I was blown away by for a few surprising reasons, one of which may have to do with this crazy expensive lens. And I will also be going into the negatives of this camera, which there are some noteworthy issues here to consider before you buy or rent, and not just as a Sony shooter, but as a shooter period. But first, let me switch it into my favorite mode. Okay, so I think the best thing to do in the black and white mode is to take it out on the streets and take pictures with it with some sort of urban decay. So I took it around the block. I found this like abandoned warehouse thing that looks like it's from an old Western. Um, it's probably only from the 1940s knowing Los Angeles. So I use the rich portrait tone and some pop settings, um, but I think the black and white is where it's gonna look the coolest. And I think pretty much anything looks better, especially like urban decay stuff in black and white. So let me show you. Again, my perspective is that I'm currently a Sony shooter mostly, but I'm not a brand loyalist at all. But what may or may not surprise you is I started with Nikon back in the mid 90s, my first point and shoot film camera actually, that I took to Italy with me as my first real travel camera. And then again, some 10 years ago, I had the D5200, which I actually love and produce fantastic images. If you notice my profile picture here is with that Nikon in hand, but I eventually sold it for the original Sony A7 see. I also have a fondness for Nikon's old film cameras and their historical place in photography. Even my grandma, I think, was a Nikon shooter way back when. So when the Nikon ZFC came out, I had considered it, but I usually lean towards full frame as someone who shoots real estate from time to time. So when the ZF was announced, I got the itch again and maybe the itch to switch, but thankfully I didn't have to buy it to try it. Sorry for the rhyming. I've been watching a Wonka a lot lately, but this is where Lens Rentals comes in. This is not sponsored, but I do have a coupon code for 15% off when you use BCAT15, and 15% goes a long way. So do look into it as I rented the camera and this 24 to 70 f2.8 for six days, which may or may not have been the best lens choice. But the best part with lens rentals isn't just how easy it is to use and ship back, but also if you like the gear you're renting, you can just purchase it and deduct the money you've already spent on it. So the question then is, is the Nikon ZF a rent to own type of camera or just a nice to look at over the price shelf ornament like some of my old film cameras? So let's dive into that and who is this camera for? And as a Sony shooter, typically, is there any reason to make the switch? As we all know, changing ecosystems with lenses, batteries and accessories and whatnot can be a massive headache. Yet with the Z mount, there's a simple workaround. So maybe I can literally just have this one and done 24 to 70 lens and be good or maybe it might be worth looking at a smaller prime. 
So the first reason that you may want to consider the ZF is a superficial one for some, but it's not nothing. And this is what sets the ZF apart from any of my Sony cameras is style. And this silly reason is partly why the Fuji X100V was so in demand and why I almost bought the X106 and said, it's a retro style camera that looks as good as it shoots, whereas all my Sony cameras are the most utilitarian in design. And that's why I always feel the need to customize my cameras with skins. Whereas with the ZF, the only thing needed would be a better way to hold it, but I'll get into all that. Oh, and yes, the elephant in the room is I actually did just buy this lens and all because it was only $600, which to me is a steal. So review coming for this guy soon. Okay, so this is a Nikon ZFC. I just got this lens this morning, so this is the first time I actually press and record. So I just want to give you an initial impression of what the image looks like, but I'll have a full review on this coming soon. Okay, bye. Yeah, it's also interesting to note that Nikon just acquired a red. So if I was buying stock in a camera company, Nikon might be it. So imagine a retro styled FX3 type of camera with a red sensor and internal RAW that could snap pics. Well, then maybe I would switch. But other than the ZF being a sexy, nostalgic, vibey camera that does harken back to a time when film cameras ruled the planet, and Nikon was sort of the king back then. And Sony wasn't even Sony, it was Minolta. Now, for better or worse, the camera does handle like a camera from the era, but due to that association, it does slow down my process with shooting, and strangely, I do enjoy taking my time with it. And yet the internals are as modern as you'd expect with a flip out screen, so you can vlog on it, which is not something you could obviously do with an old film camera. Okay, so this is the Nikon ZF. I'm at night trying to see what the low light performance of this camera is. Um, I'm in manual mode, but I am in auto ISO. I'm at 51,200 right now. Uh, let's go into a little bit darker condition. It's having some issues with uh, eye autofocus in general. It is a sharp image. I am in that uh, rich portrait tone again, so it's a bit more contrasty than normal. Um, I'll try to switch it to the flat to see if that looks any better. Okay, now this is in the flat picture profile. So you can see the blacks are a little bit more lifted, less contrast. Um, so that would probably help it. Um, I'll try N-Log later <laughs> once I figure out how to. So it's worth briefly noting some of the specs here so you can compare to the other cameras in this price range. And I will state out front, it is one of the cheapest full frame hybrid cameras from 2023 and 2024, which is in itself an advantage over the Fuji's crop sensors. But when I'm looking at the A7C2 that has a 33 megapixel sensor for roughly $200 more, whereas the ZF has a 24.5 megapixel sensor, but it does have pixel shift shooting by combining a 32 image sequence to capture a 96 megapixel image. And in video, you do get an oversampled 6K, but just like the A7C2, only gives you that 4K 60 frames per second in crop mode. And you do get 10-bit H.265 and N-Log. So here's some footage between the Sony ZV-E1 and the Nikon ZF, first with s Cinetone picture profile and their rich portrait. And then between S-Log3 and N-Log. Now, I initially graded the footage by hand, but then I remembered Gamut, link below, who is my go-to resource for super affordable creative LUTs and the cleanest conversion LUTs that I always use to monitor in camera and in post in S-Log3, but they also have an amazing N-Log for Rec. 709 conversion LUT too, and the N-Log LUT was less than $20, so check them out. Now, not only is this from a Sony perspective, but a video first perspective, and maybe that's not why most people will pick up this camera. And I do still love photography, and like most of us, that's what got me into cameras, but video is what I'm currently inspired by. And for video, I'm also thankful I have these Freewell Magnetic Quick Swap 2.0 neutral density filters. That's how I got this opening shot, and I'll probably be doing a full video on these because once you go magnetic filters, you can't go back. And with 2.0, they have this amazing lens cap, which again, now I want for every lens that I own, but I'll link the product below. And for shooting video, this Freewell filter system is a necessity, but I did actually keep them on when I was taking some pics because this retro film looking camera actually inspired me to take more pictures than videos because how the body felt to hold but it wasn't all good and i will give you a long list of negatives of reasons that you should probably know if you're considering picking this camera up yeah first speaking of negatives i had planned this backlit sunset in the park narrative photo shoot and i had all my gear strapped on and ready to roll so here's what i'm taking with me i got my google pixelate pro i've got my gopro 
I've got my Nikon ZF. I've got my Jing uh, portable softbox. I've got my Sony ZV-1 and tripod in there. <sighs> I'm ready to go. I think I got a lot of coverage. I'll show you. But on the only day that my friend was available to let me take pictures of her in this short rental period that I had it, of course, it decides to rain. Now, if you didn't know, it's been raining a lot in Los Angeles of late, so I almost scrapped the whole shoot together until I remembered my portable sunshine machine. Honestly, this saved my shoot, so it's worth noting that for me, this is now an essential piece of compact gear to go with any compact camera, especially for one man or one woman shooters when you're not in a studio. And I may do a full review on this, but let me at least mention the Zhiyun Molus X100 Pro. It's a crazy compact bicolor light that you can just carry it in hand with this cute little softbox, or you can put it on a proper light stand and use a full size light dome because it has a Bowens mount adapter. And this thing is proper bright. Like I think I was only at 30 or 40% brightness. Now I wasn't rushed fighting the sun because I brought my own sunset. So this was a quick photo shoot, which really made me fall for this camera. But after snapping over 500 shots and a bunch of video in a crunch time professional scenario in the rain, you learn a lot and fast, the good and the bad. And it's worth noting the bad about this camera before you buy it or rent it, which I wish I knew beforehand, but back to my portrait session. You're doing everything perfect. I just uh, more angry at the camera. I need a little bit more light on your face. Let's go back into color. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, reading or writing. Yeah, you look. It looks good like that. Now, if you can, I might move your chair a bit. If you can, sort of angle your chair a little bit towards me. Yep. they call the hero shot. It's gonna get <laughs> that you know how she does it. All right, so Mike, Jesus, please stop running. If you stand in front of this thing, <laughs> um, and stand like right. Yep, now turn around. Perfect.
sure we got something. Should be one good picture. In there. Okay. Thank you. Now, in case this needs to be mentioned, but as a Sony shooter, we get spoiled by how good the autofocus is compared to like everybody else. So when you pick up a Fuji, a Panasonic, or whatever cool looking camera you have, you forget how subpar everyone else's autofocus is. But we often forget that Nikon now has great autofocus. And I say just slightly behind Sony and maybe up there with Canon, or at least close enough that it's negligible. So if I had any shots that I missed, it was my fault and not the cameras. But some other issues I had were definitely definitely the cameras. And it's worth noting that when you shoot in JPEG and RAW, you can go into Lightroom where you can play with the color profiles after. So even if you do shoot in black and white, you are not married to it. You can use all the same in-camera profiles if you want. So obviously, it's always recommended to shoot in RAW as well. Now just for comparison, here's a few snaps of the same subject matter, ranging from the 50 megapixels to 12. And between the Nikon ZF, the ZFC, the original Sony A7C, the Sony A7C2, the Sony ZVE1, and my Google Pixel A Pro. And yet, it's hard for me to rank them. Now, speaking of rankings, let me get to some of the things that I'm annoyed by, that I dislike, as well as some things that I straight up loathe about the ZF, which will be listed by their severity from the meh to the worst. First, these eyelets suck. They jingle and they jangle. What is this, 2020? Again, I know Nikons are not primarily for videographers, but after the red acquisition may end up being that, but it's still an oversight and an easy fix. Next, I find the placement of the trash can button annoying. So. I should be able to review my photos and delete with one hand like I can on Sony's. It did really slow me down and actually the ZFC has a much better layout and menu. I also dislike the locations of the SD cards with this flimsy battery port. And yet it's nice that there is this micro SD redundancy slot too within that, but I actually didn't use it. Yeah, I would have loved a side SD slot, which could have been made possible with the bigger grip. That would have saved me money because then I didn't have to buy all these accessories, but I'll get to the grip gripe in a sec. And in general, all the port doors felt very flimsy and again makes me appreciate Sony's even more. Now, I also dislike the custom button on the front as it's too easy to bump and initially it was set to white balance, but later I changed it to crop mode. But if I bumped it, it seemed like it would interrupt my recordings when it was set to white balance, which now I don't know if it was just my copy of the camera or something I was doing wrong, but on a few occasions the camera just shut off without warning whether or not I bumped anything. And then also at weird times, the monitor would just turn off at random angles. And again, maybe it's an issue with this particular camera, but the monitor would do strange things and felt a little flimsy and not well designed, even though the Nikon ZF has a far superior monitor and EVF in resolution to any of my Sony cameras by a lot, almost double the dots of both. And yet the build quality does feel slightly inferior. Now this did feel dramatically inferior and drove me crazy as it's my main contact point to the camera and that was the shutter. Now I'm used to a firmer button that when half pressed resets or locks in your focus points like on Sony's. This shutter button however is so sensitive that there's really no half pressing it in the way that I'm accustomed to. So I took a bunch of accidental shots because of how sensitive it is. And apparently you can buy an official soft shutter release button for it, which annoys me even more that that's another add on that you almost need to buy. So before I get to the worst things, I will say it took me a long, long time in the menus to get this camera up and running because everything, especially how the autofocus was set up, was funky. So thankfully, I had the time and patience to dig through the menus, but this leads me to my next complaint. Now, I thought Sony menus were bad, but the user interface is not good, and the organization of the items within the menu are not intuitive at all. And you shouldn't have to work so hard to turn on a camera's ISO into auto. This is straight up dumb. It should be a point on the dial that you can manually turn to instead of digging into the menu each time. The interface feels as retro as the body, which does make me appreciate the work that Sony has done recently to make their menus better. I'm still hoping that one day people will just mimic Blackmagic's intuitive menu system, but I will say I like a challenge at least, so it was still fun to try to figure out the whole new system within a few days. But before spending hours in the menu trying to get my head around it all, I had to do two things first. As soon as I opened the box from the lens rentals and I held the camera, I immediately went on Amazon and bought, er, 
borrow the script because it's holding this camera, especially with a big lens on it, is near impossible. So I think Nikon should have included something like this in the box, and I would have previously thought that this is a strange thing to do until Sony started including a base plate hand grip with their Sony A7CR, which is brilliant and still mostly unnecessary by comparison because the Sony A7C2 and the R, for me, have the best grips of any compact cameras, and the ZF and the ZVE1 have the worst grips. But thankfully, Small Rig does make this link below, and it's actually perfect and completely necessary in my opinion. I also had to put some Peak Design clips on and my wrist strap, as I have straps on all my cameras. So by day two, I was actually ready to hold and not drop this camera. But my least favorite thing about this camera is the rolling shutter performance. It isn't great, or it seems to be made worse by their stabilization system, which warps and wobbles at the edges, giving you some jello head artifacting. Now, the stabilization itself isn't that bad with eight stops of stability and a five axis VR vibration reduction stabilization that can be set to different points in photo, but still jello y in video. Now, let me follow up the worst with the best. The ZF has the best manual focusing system, which deserves a separate video onto itself. But let me just say six days is not a long time to get to know a completely different camera system and I'm sure I did many things wrong. But I do judge a camera on how easy it is to use for beginners and some cameras you can just pick up and snap a pic or press record and then slowly experiment and learn more. And I don't think the Nikon ZF is one of those types of cameras. Now it may not be easy to use yet surprisingly it may be the most fun camera to not just look at but to pick up and play with and it made me want to take more pictures with it and really get back into photography and that's what a camera should do but it's possible it wasn't just the camera. Now I want to be wary of any bias that I may have because I must remember that partially what I'm in love with is this lens and not just the camera. And to be fair, I don't own a 24 to 70 yet on my Sony's because of the typical size and price of them. The Sony's GM2 is smaller, but it's over two grand. And this Z mount 24 to 70's only downfall at still over $2,000 is that it is double the weight. But I could see somebody maybe having this lens and just one other compact prime like a 20 or a 40 and just be good and not need anything else. So this lens is that good and probably gives the Nikon ZF an unfair advantage when comparing it to my other Sony's. And it really got me considering if I now need a comparable 20, 40, 70 and E mount. And then if I decide to get the ZF, I'd probably just get an E mount to Z mount adapter because the great thing about Z mounts is they are the largest of all mounts. So they are very easy to adapt. Regardless now, I don't know if I'm sold on this camera or just this lens. Now clearly the Nikon ZF is a capable camera that is as fun to use as I think it's cool to look at because it's modeled after the FM line. Like I'd happily wear this around my neck like one might with a Fuji or a Leica and maybe shoot more. Whereas like I said before, most Sony cameras and Panasonics are boring and newer Nikons and Canons are just sort of ugly. Just my personal taste, not hating on any brand because nowadays all these cameras are terrific. So it becomes the little things that may motivate us to pick up one of these camera bodies over another. So I think Nikon was really smart here. Now if Canon took one of their old vintage bodies with their newer internals, I think they smash it and I'd happily rent that too. So until then, look into lensrentals.com and get 15% off with BCAT15 and check for yourself if the Nikon ZF ticks the boxes for you. And now I just have to think, does it for me? But two things that I'm definitely keeping and are easy buys are the Xiaoyang Molus 100W portable light as it saved this video for me and the Freewell Quick Swap 2.0 magnetic ND filters. Okay, thank you all for your time and attention. I've got a bunch more videos about videos like this on the way, so consider following along and subscribing. All right, thanks a lot guys, bye.